it said there's a 1% chance that he'll return to his normal self and a 99% chance that he will be terribly brain damaged. I think if the wife had said in that circumstance, please, he never wanted to be brain damaged, he was an athlete and active, those odds are terrible, take him off the machine, I don't think that would have been such an ethical conundrum. What if it's 5%, 10%, 15 20 30% that he'll return. And who's to say that we doctors are so good at it that we can give these numbers so clearly? It's not like it's not like measuring a, into a beaker how many cc's of diluent. You know, these are best case prognostications or guesstimates. That's why this is a tough ethical situation. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you said the police didn't think it was foul pay. I would see whether or not the wife had anything to do with it because they were already having like, um, marital problems. Uh -huh. And maybe, you know, she has something to do with it and it was her way of trying to get rid of him. Yeah. And, you know, because he still has a 66% chance of living and being mm -hmm. okay. Being that he'll be perfect from what he was and then maybe all right a little bit diminished. So he has a 66% chance of waking up and being able to still function and be by himself. So why would she want to kill him unless she had reasons for him to be dead? Yeah, I, I think, you know, your concerns about the wife's motivations were very much in our mind. And the more we spoke to her and learned a bit about her, the more concerned we were. And yet, that's why this became such a difficult thing. You know, our job in the Ethics Committee, we're not the police. We're not there to investigate and show me his will and this and that. On the other hand, we did have interaction with her and we did... Um, uh, we did form opinions about what her potential motivations are, and again, when somebody makes a request like that that seems so out of line with what we normally see in the large number of people that we deal with, it does raise certain questions. On the other hand, nobody was willing to say that this lady is psychotic or a criminal or that she really had, you know, something to do with, with what happened to him. So, and she was very threatening too. She said, you know, if she threatened us with a lawsuit, if we don't do the right thing, this is, she said, I have the right, I know my rights, this is, and here is my, uh, here is on the healthcare agent, etc., etc." So we were all, we had these same uneasy feelings as, as you did. Um, yes, sir. You said something really peculiar that caught my eye. You yeah. said that a couple Put of years ago. Put your ear. <laughs> <laughs> We're still on the cataract coverage. Yeah, it's on the cataract coverage. But, um, you said that the wife's financial situation had decreased Correct. a couple of years before the accident. So even though we're not investigators, I would say you should look at his insurance claim yeah. because there might be a couple million in it for her if he passed away. You're, you're, Conveniently. You are you are correct, <laughs> and I, I think as a matter of fact, she actually verbalized uh, at one point the significant financial burdens that she might have to bear should he have a life of dependency and require nursing care, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything you folks are saying are absolutely true. The question is, does that constitute enough for us to say, we are not going to listen to you even though you have the... Remember another thing, by the way, that although any time that we meet with family on these decisions, we don't do psychiatric evaluations of families who make requests. And I don't know the ulterior motives that might be in the minds of many of the people that we deal with. So that's a tough area. The area of motivations is a very kind of a tricky area. Let me tell you, because we are, I think, running out of time. Uh, let me tell you what happened here. I think you, you, by your good questions, you really did point on some of the very important issues here. What happened was that um, after about a week or 10 days of this woman asking that enough is enough, we had an emergency ethics committee meeting with the, mom, with the wife and also her, her, her father, who was the father-in-law of this man. And we decided at that point, she made, a, uh, she made this case about how he would never want to live, uh, debilitated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in the back of our minds also was the fact that he was also doing better medically and we did not feel that the issue was as critical in life and death at that point in terms of removing the ventilator. So we removed the ventilator, and the man continued to improve off the respirator. And I'll tell you, it's very interesting. The wife, uh, and he was sent out of the intensive care unit, and the wife, uh, initially, I went there one day to see the man. His eyes were open. He was talking with us. 
He wasn't quite all there, though, and she said, oh, it's so wonderful to see his blue eyes again. This is great, and she was happy. I thought, wonderful. However, the man eventually left the hospital, went to a rehab center, and I subsequently got uh, a couple of emails from the wife, which were really like poison pen letters, that apparently his improvement neurologically and brain-wise had plateaued, that he, uh, he was not himself. He did have some deficits, very much as the neurologist had predicted. The man was actually able to walk into the office of the neurologist who had taken care of him in the ICU. But he had problems with his memory. He would be confused at times. The woman was angry, angry, angry. She said, you have destroyed both of our lives, not just his life, but my life. And it was really, she was extremely angry that, that we had kept him alive and that this was the state that he was in. And um, she said, if I ever have to go in a hospital, they'll never go near me with an IV, nothing, etc., etc." So, I mean, you know, we are, we're doctors, we're not prophets. Um, I still think that we did, that this was handled appropriately. We actually did take him off the ventilator, but she finally insisted on it. He was well enough to continue on his own. Uh, what her motivations are, I don't know, but we are suspect of them as well. So I, I just want to, that was the follow-up. I don't know how it is today. Um, but to tell you that we grapple with these real-life difficult situations on a daily basis, personally, I think medical ethics is a fascinating field. Um, it's, become, it's really enriched my professional uh, career. I really uh, appreciate the fact and feel privileged to be in the position I am. And, many, and some of you who may be interested in medicine, maybe the little seed of medical ethics will be planted in your mind, and maybe you'll follow up on it and uh, join me someday. Thank you very much.